to me, this is the most exciting moment in what has already been an outstanding day. Uh, you know Mark Twain's famous aphorism about how everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, that was in an earlier pre-technology day. But we're confronted with that question. Uh, we know a great deal, if, even if there's a great deal we don't know. And the problem is, is it hopeless? We heard the very frank analysis of Ambassador Bosworth, who tells us openly, there are no solutions. There isn't a good solution. But that isn't good enough. And some of us, maybe because of uh, insufficient ignorance of the facts, uh, nevertheless persist in looking for uh, new options. Uh, I should confess I'm one of those naive people. Some of you know in 1972, my wife who was here and I took our three teenage boys to North Korea. And we were the first authorized academics to go to North Korea. And so fresh was that memory 25 years later when I got invited back that not a single member of my family wanted to accompany me. <laughs> and when on Labor Day 1997, I phoned my wife and I said, you know, it's different now. They want to know what I know. They're really different now. She said, what have you been smoking? <laughs> but we have had some experiences with them, and I've been involved in training North Koreans, 1999, 98, 99, 2000, and then again in the last year twice, always outside of North Korea, although I've been there four times. And now we have another, perhaps a unique opportunity, or perhaps it's totally phony. Perhaps my optimism in old age is overcoming me. <laughs> when Lord, I'm sure, is going to have some further stimulating thoughts. Well, I'm not going to comment uh, at length on, on Don's presentation. I'll, I'll do it indirectly by my own recommendations for the future. Uh, I will just make a couple of quick comments. First of all, being 42 and a SEAL, I think, is a plus. Uh, I'm all, all in favor of 42-year-old SEALs. Secondly, I guess one way to astutely consolidate your position is to execute your uncle. <laughs> Thirdly, uh, you say we're demonizing the North Korean regime. I don't think they need our help. They're demonizing themselves. But let me uh, concentrate on the future and be rather concrete. And to know where I'm going, you've got to know where I come from. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with my background, I am a flaming centrist uh, in insight and outlook on most issues. I was a political appointee of both Presidents Reagan and Clinton. So therefore, I'm not John Bolton. Uh, for example, I strongly supported the 1994 agreement. I was Assistant Secretary of State at the time. My deputy was Gallucci's deputy. I was closely involved while I took care of the rest of Asia, and I that included holding the hands of the South Koreans who were nervous about this process. I also worked closely with our keynote speakers, uh, Ambassador Bosworth on, on Cato. I think that agreement froze the North Korea nuclear and missile programs for several years and was a great success. I think it was the only period when there was a genuine possibility that North Korea might forego nuclear weapons. And despite their cheating on the uranium issue, I think we jettisoned this agreement too soon. I also supported the 2005 principles and the leap year agreement, which, of course, the North Koreans dumped. On the other hand, I'm not Don Gregg either, <laughs> or Kim Dae-jung, who I think bribed his way to a summit with $500 million and a subsequent Nobel Prize and followed a feckless unilateral sunshine policy. Now, I'm still a centrist on, on most issues, but I have to say over the years, the treachery 
the dangers and the cruelty of the North Korean regimes have just about boltonized me. <laughs> Let's look at some facts. In considering policy toward North Korea, there are no good routes available, as Steve Bosworth said. Now, our distinguished leader here says that's not good enough. Uh, and let me just say, let's look for the least bad. But there are no good routes available. It's a tough issue. Why is that so? First of all, this North Korean regime will never give up nuclear weapons or its delivery systems. They see them as the perceived self-interest to deter the United States. It's the only prestige item for the domestic population. It gets world attention and aid. It's often stated by authoritative leadership that they are nuclear power to stay, that they will talk to us as a nuclear power. It's in their constitution, and we've seen past negotiation attempts to rid them of this. They're the only country in the world that threatens the use of nuclear weapons, and they practice proliferation to Iran and Syria, etc. Secondly, this North Korean regime will never stop crushing its people. This is made clear for 65 years through three dynastic leaders. In the past century, if you're raiding cruel regimes, the gold medals go to Mao, Hitler, and Stalin. The Kims get the silver medal because of scale, and the only challenge comes from Pol Pot. Now, the world largely tolerated this for many years, as has been pointed out by, by Greg and others, until the superb authoritative UN report, Commission Inquiry, which I must say I'm a proud member of the HRNK. There's many other terrific human rights organizations here also had a role uh, in pushing for this commission and providing substance to it. Uh, and of course, I don't have to go over the crimes that have been documented. You're all familiar with it. I'll just remind you of the basic quote when I talk about crimes against humanity, quote, the gravity, scale, and nature of violations reveals a state that has no parallel in the contemporary world. Thirdly, the policy of this administration is not working. <coughs> Don is entirely correct. It has not Hooray. stopped or even slowed the nuclear threat and human rights disasters. Fourthly, a military option must be ruled out for a whole host of reasons. I don't think I have to elaborate. Fifthly, both sticks and carrots are relatively ineffective. Pressures against North Korea are undercut by China. China is part of the problem, not the solution. And carrots, or incentive, will not make this regime give up its nuclear weapons. Its official policy is a dual one of pursuing both nuclear weapons and economic development. But Kim knows that real economic reform and outside trade and investment will lead to the collapse of his regime. Moreover, successive administrations of both parties have offered in principle almost everything that North Korea has demanded without success. Security guarantees, diplomatic relations, assistance. In short, the record on either interim steps or grand bargains is bleak indeed. Finally, six party talks, and I've always favored these multilateral talks, not just bilateral, but so far, We've seen this ugly pattern. And someone said you can't buy a horse twice. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, with all due respect to Steve, I think it does make sense. We bought the horse several times. Uh, we, North Koreans make a gesture. We respond. We give aid. They make agreements. They break the agreements. They do provocations. And we get back in the same circle. OK, now I've told you why it's tough. What do we do about it? What do we do in the face of all these obstacles? First, on the human rights issue, it's now been elevated as a priority along with nukes, and it should remain so. We should do the maximum we can for a strong resolution in the UN General Assembly, uh, and including the ICC and pursuing accountability, and then the Security Council if possible. Uh, I'm sorry to say, Jerry, it is open and shut. The Chinese will veto it, as will the Russians. There's no chance they won't veto it. We should also keep pressing implementation of COI along the lines of Chairman Kirby. And he lays out a whole series of ways we can follow up on this beyond the ones we've talked to today, including, of course, the office in Seoul 
to document and, and continue to raise accountability issues. Uh, if we have to make the Chinese veto, so be it. I don't agree that this is going to depend on U.S.-China relations. I, I would hope and I'm sure the U.S. will be forceful uh, on this. Now, this report has rattled the North Koreans, as we've all said, uh, and they've mounted a major diplomatic campaign. I won't go into it because it's been outlined by, by David Hawke uh, and others. Uh, we, of course, welcome the release of prisoners. How can you not welcome the release of prisoners? But they shouldn't have been taken in the first place. If I'm beating you over the head and I stop, I guess you're happy, but how grateful are you that I started beating you in the first place? <clears throat> now, having said all that, however insincere or tactical the North Korean response, we should pursue dialogue with them with some clear caveats that have already been laid out by Greg and others. Any visits, you don't barter away parts of the resolution before the visit even starts. You pursue it along UN standards of free access to the country, to talk to people without supervision, to make sure they don't get punished, et cetera, et cetera. I think the focus should be on gulags, the areas, as someone suggested, that the North Koreans have already identified they're willing to talk about, uh, and perhaps the Songbon system, just to take some examples. At the same time, as Roberta Cohen and others have pointed out, we have to press China on its complicity with crimes against humanity. Their treatment of North Korean refugees is not only illegal, of course, it's immoral. And we should enlist the South Koreans, because they do have some impact, uh, and they've had some success with the Chinese on this issue. Secondly, on six-party talks, I think it's extremely reasonable that people like Steve Bosworth and Don Gregg are searching, whether it's Six Party or some other channel, that we have to be talking to the North Koreans. Because after all, we're getting nowhere with the policy of strategic uh, patience. Uh, North Korea has been racing ahead with its programs, uh, and therefore uh, it's only natural that we look hard for a possible dialogue. And however insincere or tactical we think their recent signals have been, there have been a series of them for some reason. So I, I do not rule out, I'm not adverse in principle to restarting the six-party talks, though there's no chance of achieving denuclearization. Uh, I believe a cap on nukes and missiles would be a positive step. I'd rather have North Korea have six to eight nuclear weapons than a hundred of them. I'd rather have them reach only the region and not the continental U.S. In short, uh, if we can get there, and that's a big if, these talks, we ought to aim, even while reaffirming the denuclearization principle, we have to do that for political reasons, but we all know it's not going to happen. In short, on nukes, no more, no better, and no sale. But I agree with the administration on the conditions to get there, so we don't repeat past patterns. Now, my own fundamental criteria are, as I say, maintain the principle of denuclearization, but then freeze all nuclear and missile developments with the strictest possible verification. That's very tough because of the uranium issue. But we've got to do that before we talk, otherwise the clock is ticking and they continue to develop their capabilities even as we're talking. Uh, in short, I'm not only adverse, not adverse to, but I'm in favor of probing privately, which I suggest we're doing, the possibility of a North Korean freeze so that we can resume six-party talks, which, as I say, for the near or middle term, the only thing we can expect is to stop them where they are now rather than letting it get worse. Thirdly, if North Korea is not willing to negotiate along these lines, we should work for regime change. We have a ge geopolitical and moral obligation to do so. It should be undeclared and unofficial, of course, but that should be our goal. Only regime change will eliminate the nuclear threat. Only regime change will ease the suffering of the North Korean people. Now, I'm well familiar with the arguments against this, and they're good arguments. Of course, this is very difficult to achieve. We've seen recurring predictions and hopes that others have cited about the regime was about to collapse, and they do survive. And I can't quarrel with, with Don and, and Steve on this issue. Uh, they've survived isolation and pressures. 
and they survived primarily because of the Chinese safety net, despite Beijing's increasing frustrations with North Korea, and I've just come back from Beijing and talked to them about this subject, and a somewhat tougher line, China will continue to place regime survival over denuclearization. And North Korea knows this, whatever their own frustrations with Beijing, and their own desire to reduce their dependence on China. It's also tough because the South Koreans would not be aboard any official regime change. Uh, we must take account their wishes, it's their peninsula. Of course, most experts say the Kim regime is here to stay. It may well be, it probably is. But that's what everybody said about the Berlin Wall right. and the Soviet Union. At some point, there will be a collapse of this hideous regime. Of course, changing the regime would be dangerous. But I prefer such risks to the inevitability of North Korean nukes and missiles and the continual squashing of the North Korean people. And there would be other economic and geopolitical benefits for the region. Uh, it would make it a more stable region. It would increase prosperity. And while it would be expensive for South Korea, the world community should, I think, would help make this manageable. Fourthly, we have and we should continue to press Beijing on talking about contingencies on the peninsula. This could be very dangerous if the, if the regime collapses or other things happen. This is sensitive for them, they, res, they resist. Perhaps we should lay out unilaterally, since they won't talk about it, some reassurances to them, in close consultation, of course, with the South Koreans, Japanese. For example, we could say that in the event of a regime change or collapse, we would support the UN or the IEA going in to secure nuclear weapons and destroying them, rather than the PLA or the 82nd Airborne. With respect to refugee flows, we could tell the Chinese we would maximum effort to direct them towards South Korea uh, rather than China, and for those who go to China, we would provide financial help. We could say that under reunification, U.S. troops in South Korea could possibly be reduced and in any event would stay south and not come close to China. We should continue and could in these talks underline that reunification of South Korea is less threatening to Chinese interests than in the current situation where other countries may get nukes in the region, where there's an increasing U.S. military presence in response and where it's costing China a lot of money and international prestige. As Roberta Cohen said, China just might be more comfortable with such an end result than they are now if we could have these kind of talks. But it, like us, is nervous about how we get from here to there, and it is risky. In any event, frank discussions of red lines, respective security concerns, might possibly ease Chinese fears and therefore their calculation on regime change. Let me conclude just very briefly in implementing this de facto regime change policy, which I said would only come after seeing whether we could have a dialogue with the North Koreans under the concept of a freeze. In that case, we should increase sanctions, including on North Korean banks and business enterprises. Someone pointed out the effectiveness of the sanctions on the Delta Bank. It hits China as well. Good. It tells China their policy is costing them. We should try to undermine elite and military support for the regime by curbing the flow further of luxury goods and privileges with which they depend. We should have tighter interdiction of suspected North Korean cargoes. We should keep pressing, as I've said, North Korean human rights. We should increase the flow of information of the outside world to the North Korean people, as Ms. Lee has eloquently said is so effective, through social media, telephones, Radio Free Asia, DVDs, etc. We should increase our military deployments to the region, specifically, specifically anti-missile defenses with the South Koreans and Japanese, joint exercises. These will serve for deterrence and war fighting capabilities. It will increase the cost to the Chinese of their policy and will reassure the countries of the region. So I end up on this note. The purpose of this policy, and again, I would prefer the dialogue and hope we can engineer it, but we should pivot to this, if you excuse the word, if we can. 
we should face North Korea with a choice. They said they want nuclear weapons and economic development. We have to say in actions as well as words, you can have nukes or you can have economic development, you can't have both. Assuming the regime chooses the former, let's step up the pressures despite all the obstacles I've acknowledged. If this does not alter North Korean policy or cause regime change, at least it'll slow down the pace of their programs and shine more light on the agony of the North Korean people. Thank you. You know, we had a good program here in April on human rights in China. And my only disappointment was that when Lord turned us down when I asked him to speak. And that annoyed me because I thought he could just wing it to what the rest of us do. You make a few notes and you just talk. But I can see what he means. He took this very, very seriously. And I hope you will publish this in Foreign Affairs magazine because I don't want to lose it. I won't get a visa to North Korea. Well, I would like to get it <laughs> on all these nuances. So, and you've got it already done. But you've heard two very good presentations. And they show we're approaching a kind of crossroads. Something has to give. What gets priority? And it reminds me in 1977-78, when the American people were having trouble deciding what to do about normalization of relations with China. We knew China had been a hideous human rights violator, and there were many intelligent people in this country who said that we shouldn't normalize relations with that communist dictatorship until they got their Human Rights Act together. Some of us thought it was important to normalize relations in order to improve the human rights situation in China. But even we had disagreements. I remember John Fairbank uh, wrote a Sunday Washington Post uh, op-ed talking about, of course, we should normalize with China. And don't worry about human rights. The Chinese people are different. They don't care about human rights the way we do. And I agreed with John that we should normalize relations, but it made me very angry what he said. And I wrote a piece the next week saying, because we should normalize relations with China, we shouldn't read the Chinese people out of the human race, that they too would appreciate fundamental human rights, and therefore we should go ahead and normalize relations. Now here we're confronting this dilemma. On the one hand, we're finally getting some progress in getting a kind of attention in the world community that has obviously shaken up the leadership. On the other hand, if the process goes ahead, it may well end any chance that this new warm policy that's coming out of Pyongyang might offer. And we have to balance. And is the opportunity to go ahead with Pyongyang and open up contacts so we no longer have to rely on the image of North Korea put out by the White House and the State Department and the Defense Department the way we used to rely on that image about China and about Vietnam. The more people we can get in there, the more diverse the people can be as observers, the more the greater the opportunity for perceptions. I think all of that is important. On the other hand, we have to say on the basis of the track record that Wynn cites, the odds that this new warm fuzzy approach out of Pyongyang will really amount to something, probably very slim. Whereas going ahead with the condemnation uh, for violation of, uh, for commission of crimes against humanity, we know is going to have some out. Outcome. On the other hand, that's not likely to succeed if the outcome is the ICC. Although, as I said earlier, China's got to be thinking again, does it want to veto any effort 
from the Security Council. Now maybe this, these things can be reconciled through some diplomatic process that would be satisfactory to people who want to see the vindication of human rights after so many decades of delay and still move this ahead. I don't know, but that's, this is the dilemma we're confronting and this is why we ultimately put this program together in the way we did in order to see what deserves to be done for human rights and yet what needs to be done if we're ever gonna see progress with the DPRK. Uh, but it could be that regime change is inevitable but I'm not for it. I think the risks are much too high at this point. On the other hand, there are risks in going ahead and letting North Korea compile a greater body of nuclear <clears throat> weapons. So this is, I won't say there's no solution, but <clears throat> what we've heard today is refining our analysis and making it obvious that uh, some choices uh, have to be made. Chairman Mao admonished us to walk on two legs, but it doesn't seem in this case we can walk on both legs. Maybe careful diplomatic handling of this according to Wynne's formula, uh, supplemented by what Don said, can be helpful, but I don't see this in our government and I certainly don't see this in the Congress. The Congress is really a backward element. The Council on Foreign Relations made a move in the late 90s to move toward North Korea at a time when the North Koreans showed receptivity to contact. And we invited a delegation to come over from Pyongyang. They, people tried to bait the speaker both in Washington and New York at the Council trying to make him walk out in anger uh, at the kinds of questions they asked. But this Vice Minister Kim was the smoothest item I'd seen in a long time. When we met in Pyongyang before he came, he looked just like Kim Il-sung and dressed just like Kim Il-sung. But when he showed up in New York, he was in a wonderful, very expensive striped suit like an investment banker. He had a beautiful sulka tie, very nice tie pin. He obviously liked the sugar-coated bullets of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and when I said to him, where are you going after New York and Washington? He said, my interpreter, a very good-looking Korean woman, and I, we're going off to Davos for the conference in, held every year in January. He said, we're only going to go to the conference for a day, but then we'll go skiing for a couple of weeks. I thought, this is my kind of North Korean. And he offered to make an agreement with the council for exchange of contact, and to my disappointment, the council turned it down. They were too afraid of what will Congress say. And the same thing with our task force of 1998, the same period. I was in those conference deliberations, and people openly said in Washington, we can't go ahead, Congress will never stand for it. And I said, what is the function of the Council on Foreign Relations? To follow Congress or to stimulate Congress to consider a new approach? We went through the same thing with China in the late 60s and 70s. So this is really a fascinating, important, and difficult problem. But we still have 15 minutes to hear from you. I'm sorry to go on so long. Yes, please. in September and all I heard was why are you people want to invade us and for a couple of days I couldn't understand I was getting questions from all kinds of people including a couple of military officers and then I heard that we had uh, combined drills with the uh, South Korean army in, in August where the commanding general announced that part of the drill will be to practice a preemptive invasion of North Korea and a quick capture of Pyongyang and apparently everybody in North Korea knows about this. And, and they keep asking about sanctions. Why are you starving us? And so forth. The point of all this is these people feel they're under siege from what they call imperialist America. And I don't see how we can ever get a dialogue started with them unless we make some kind of gesture. Like we make it clear that we're not going to conduct military drills of that kind. And maybe make it clear to them that we'll relax some of the sanctions if they more forthright with us. 
Speak. Well, I would just say that these drills wouldn't be necessary if we didn't get constant threats of a conventional nuclear uh, type from the North. And uh, they're absolutely essential to deter the North Koreans and to reassure the South Koreans of our security umbrella. So the worst thing we could do would be to cut back on our military drills, in my opinion. I think they're absolutely uh, essential. And if the North Koreans reduce their threat and their rhetoric and their deployments, we can reduce our exercises. When I, yeah, when I was there in uh, uh, February, Ri Young Ho said, uh, you know, the B-29 is in our DNA. And it was the B-29 that f flattened a good deal of North Korea in the war using napalm. And he said, when you fly a B-52 at us with nuclear weapons, we don't like it. And uh, I said, I hear you. So uh, I, I don't know when I've heard someone say more things that I thoroughly disagree with than uh, Ambassador Lord. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, that, what, that makes it a stimulating uh, a, a program. And, uh, what are the key points, Don? Uh, regime change. Oh. Uh, I, uh, you know, I was a young buck in CIA and the Dulles brothers had a list of eight countries where they were going to bring about regime change. One was Iran, judged as a success at the time. Second was Guatemala. Uh, third was uh, Cuba. And uh, I, I think that when you try to force a totalitarian regime, which is North Korea, to change, you eventually have a disaster. You have to fight them. And uh, I think that reaching out to uh, both China and the Soviet Union uh, caused them to change. I think we have in North Korea a realistic young leader who can be led to see that it is in their interest to change. And uh, that, that can happen. And uh, I think to, to try to force change is, uh, is extremely dangerous and can lead to unforeseen consequences. I was well, let me just point out, first of all, I said this happens, in my view, only after we've tried to see whether we can talk to them again. But I'm sorry. Uh, given the suffering of the North Korean people, which will not stop, given the threat of the North Korean nuclear developments, which will not stop under these regimes. I have no illusions about the difficulty. I'm not talking about sending in CIA agents like Don Gregg to overthrow them. Uh, I'm talking about pressures that even if it doesn't bring about regime change, uh, will help slow down their programs and put pressure on them to make a choice between economic development and nuclear weapons. The pressure, the ultimate nirvana would be regime change. That would be a tremendous blessing for the world, in my opinion. But I have no illusions of whether that's going to be possible in the near future. But in the meantime, we can at least slow down their programs and hopefully direct them to a choice in which they, they decide economic development, rather nuclear weapons, is in their interest. So I make no apologies for stepping up our pressures if we can't negotiate. And the track record makes us seem pretty pessimistic on that score. Yes, please. And then Ed Baker next. Recognizing what's happened from the Clinton administration into the George W. Bush administration of uh, where the agreed framework went, in what way can we assuage the fears of the North Korean leadership that if they take the risk of entering into a significant diplomatic agreement, that shifts in the American political landscape aren't going to ultimately up in that within you know, four to eight to 12 years? In other words, how can we convince the leadership to trust us? The first three questions I was asked by <clears throat> Kim Gae Guan in 2002 were as follows. Why is George W. Bush so different from his father? Uh, secondly, how do you function when you elect men as president who don't have anything in common with their predecessor? And I said, well, that's the way democracy works. Uh, and it's, it's, he said, it makes it very difficult for countries like us uh, to keep in step with you. So I think uh, that's, you make a very good point, and I, there's no, I don't think there's any easy answer to that. I think. When I first heard that Kim Jong-un was on the stage, 
this is while his father was still alive, I wrote uh, Vice President Biden and I said, I'd suggest we invite him to the United States for an orientation tour. Uh, he's been educated in, uh, partly in Switzerland. Uh, he speaks some English and German. He's very curious about us. Uh, this would give us a chance to look at him and him to look at us. And I said, even if they don't accept the invitation, which would be amazing if they had the fact that it was offered would have a positive thing. Well, it wasn't considered. I asked why. They said, oh, the Republicans would have laughed us out of town. Khrushchev's trip to the U.S. stayed with him for a long time. I'm sorry? Nikita Khrushchev's trip to the United States when Eisenhower was president, that stayed with him for a very, very long time. Yeah. I heard uh, Khrushchev's grand, uh, granddaughter talking. I was on a program where, where she was talking, and she said very much the same way, and she saw him as a reformer. Ed Baker is an expert on all of Korea, who's been at this game for about 45 years, and uh, I'd like to hear what he thinks. Well, uh, it's a hard uh, uh, description to live up to. Uh, well, I have to say that it, it seems clear to me uh, that any, any approach to this is going to be very, very difficult, has been very difficult. But I think what we've done up until now is an abject failure. Um, the only bright spots that I see are the 1994 agreements and the success, limited though it was and obstructed though it was by Congress, uh, until um, the Bush administration began. And uh, I think that putting more pressure on North Korea, I'm not sure that there's anything we can do in the way of negotiations that is going to produce a solution. But I am sure that continuing the course we're on or going further uh, in the direction of pressure is not going to work. And it is not helping the North Korean people. Uh, I went to uh, North Korea, the, the whole western third of the country, up and down last uh, October with the Eugene Bell Foundation. The place is very poor. The, there are lots of people with a multi-drug resistant TB. They need help that their government can't give them. And they are accepting help from uh, the Eugene Bell Foundation, which is supported by individuals uh, making donations in South Korea and the United States and perhaps other places as well. Uh, clearly, the people we worked with and the people we met, their attitudes are affected by this kind of contact. They are very grateful. They are trying very hard to get into the program. If you have, multi, if you have TB and you're found not to have multi-drug resistant TB or it can't be shown that you have it, you don't get into the program. People are almost competing to get into the program in the hopes of saving their lives. I think that we need to move in the direction of more openness. As I said before, I, I would like to see six-party talks leading to uh, peace negotiations. I think North Korea will not come around until it is gradually um, integrated into the world. And I think uh, that I definitely agree with Don and Jerry. Uh, and I think that the Chinese case is, is an excellent example of the way to go. Don't forget Vietnam. Sure, Vietnam. We're now, we're now on the verge of selling weapons. To think Vietnam. Iraq. <laughs> yeah. That's the other side of the Okay. Coin. Yes, Greg. Thank you. Um, a question from Ambassador Greg. Uh, earlier there was a question about engaging North Korean diplomats in discussion of various topics. In your discussions with senior North Korean diplomats, they mentioned that the arrest and imprisonment of the three Americans had nothing to do with human rights. Jeffrey Fowle, the first American to be released, was arrested and imprisoned allegedly because he left a Bible behind. Kenneth Bay was also arrested and imprisoned because he allegedly proselytized in North Korea. It seems that this had, there's a direct link to one issue in particular, freedom of religion, which is a human rights issue. 
Do you think that it would be possible to take the discussion to the next level and maybe engage the same senior diplomats in a discussion on that particular topic and with similar topics? I don't see where your question is going. In your book, uh, leaving a Bible is a human rights issue. I think in their book it isn't. Uh, I think he, uh, when I asked him that question, I think he was absolutely clear in his mind that, that uh, the, the penal system, which he, clear, which he knows is an embarrassment, but he can't do much about. I mean, he saw that as completely separate from the idiotic things that those three uh, people had, had, had done. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think what is emerging in, in North Korea is, is leadership that will be more responsive if, if they feel that the real dialogue is, is possible. I was in uh, a conference in the UK just two or three weeks ago and I heard a number of people from the EU from countries who have ambassadors and full diplomatic relations. Uh, the Swedes act for us and do a wonderful job, uh, but the Brits have a good ambassador there and a number of others. And they see North Korea in a very different way than we do. The EU had a man who lived in Pyongyang for six years and he was able to tabulate caloric intake height increase, I mean, since the great starvation. And all of the people there who had lived in Pyongyang say the place is improving. Now that's not the prison system, but that's the overall economic uh, level. And they see, uh, they see, I think as Ed put it, they see a country trying to sort of rejoin the world. And what I am saying to them is that your prison system is unworthy of what it is you are trying to become. You have to deal with it. You have to take it into account. But I think the way that that can happen most effectively is by internally generated decision to change. And I think the more clear we make it to them that their penal system is a tremendous hindrance to their rejoining the outside world, the better chance we have of getting them to take it on themselves, which I think is the only way really to get this done without all kinds of imponderables. We've had a fabulous day. We are going to continue with a drink I think we all need. But before closing, I want to thank Melissa Lefkowitz, Mike Chenkin, Ms. Jung Chowee, and other colleagues from the US Asia Law Institute, as well as our co-hosts, <coughs> the Human Rights uh, Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Uh, I think this has been a day that Tim Gillette would have enjoyed. So thank you. <laughs>